just pray. Father God, we come right now, Lord God, as open canvases, Lord God. We pray right now, Lord God, that you would just write your words upon our heart, Lord God. Father God, as we look at facing those dark moments of our lives, God, we begin to pray that you would show us those areas, Lord God, and then that you would give us the strength to face those areas, Lord. God, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that it not be my words, Lord God, but it be your words, that your spirit would reign supreme here today. Speak to your people, Lord God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 <clears throat> you know, we've been in the season of Easter. This is just now the second week since that wonderful, joyous occasion where we celebrated the resurrection of our Lord. It's a season where we focus on the joy and the hope and the new life, the changed life that Christ offers. You know, we've looked at several people's experiences. Last week, Ali talked about Thomas and his experience of the resurrected king and how their lives had been changed. We look at their stories and we see exactly how the resurrection can change us, change our lives, change our church, change our community, even has the power to change our world. Easter means changed lives. The resurrection of Christ means changed lives. It means that God is changing lives. It's not past tense. It is something that is happening every single day. And today, as I begin to look at the story, I actually want to start before the story began and look at a little things that are leading up. At this time, what you had is you had people who were joyous, people that were excited. The news of the resurrection had traveled and all of the followers of the way, which is what they were called at this time, were excited and they were spreading the news. Jesus has risen. Jesus has risen. He is not dead. He is risen. Much like we got excited on Easter morning, this is how they felt. And they had been feeling that way. But in Acts 7, we look at the story of Stephen. We're not going to talk about Stephen today, but this is where Saul's story begins. With Stephen. And Stephen was one of those followers of the way. And he was excited. And he was carrying the good news to anyone who would listen. He was in the town square and he was preaching that Jesus has risen. But the wrong person heard him that day. A member of the Sanhedrin heard him. And the Bible says that he was brought before the Sanhedrin council to testify to exactly what he was saying. And do you know that he didn't deny that his God had risen? No, he stood boldly and proclaimed, Jesus has risen. He's resurrected. I know this. I believe this. And the, it, the Bible says that the people began to shout heresy, heresy, blasphemy. The penalty of that was death. And so the men began to pick up stones to stone him to death. But the Bible says that he didn't fear. I could see him looking at those men as they're picking up their stones. And he's saying, my Jesus isn't dead. My Jesus isn't dead. And as the people begin to stone them, they say, what say you, you heretic? The Bible says that he was so filled with the spirit that he actually saw the clouds open up and he saw the son of man standing at the right hand of the father. <coughs> that made them cry out louder, blasphemer, blasphemer. <clears throat> But Stephen saw him. And this is where Saul comes in because those very men who picked up rocks to stone him, the Bible says that they laid their, their long coats because they took off their robes. They laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul. He washed their coats while they stoned an innocent man to death. But he didn't just watch, he approved. The Bible said he became so zealous. He 
he believed that they were such blasphemers, heretics, that he got such a fire against the Christians or the followers of the way that he literally became the, the leading charge that would go and hunt them down and beat them and toss them in jail. This was Saul. When he had hunted out all that he could in Jerusalem, the Bible says that he even went to the high priest and said, look, give me a letter that I may go search them out wherever they have gone. Give me authority so that I can go into other synagogues and other towns and hunt them out and bring them back here and arrest them. This was Saul. He was a Pharisee. He had a deep love and appreciation for the Jewish <coughs> faith. He was a rabbi, very educated, could speak Arabic and Greek. He was passionate about his mission for God. He knew the scriptures backwards, forward. He was in it every single day and applied it to his life religiously. But you know what? Saul was a religious person, but he was dead wrong about his beliefs about God. He had a wonderful religion but he did not have a wonderful relationship with God. So he gets excited and he gets those letters and he's off. He's off because he's about to go hunt him down. Like a dog with a bone, he just wasn't going to let it go. He was hunting them down. And this, I want to take a moment because it sounds bleak for the Christians. It sounds bleak for the followers of the way. It sounds like they are being hunted down and they are being persecuted for believing in Jesus. But I want to let you know that when the power of God is upon you, mm. even the bleakest of times, God's will is still being done. See, the followers of, of the way were being persecuted on every side. They were being hunted down. But the Bible says that no matter what, everywhere they went, they preached the good news so that people who hadn't heard the good news began to hear the good news. You see, what Saul thought he was doing was stopping the good news, but all he was doing was spreading it and letting more people catch fire. That's all he was doing. That's right. Like a wind blowing, he was just fanning the flames. That's all he was really doing. His will was still being done. And you know, God sometimes brings about or allows bad things to happen in our life, so his will will be done. So Saul takes the letters he had received from the high priest and he begins to go to Damascus. The Bible says as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. This man, this religious man, so on fire at this point, he opened his eyes and he couldn't see. The Bible said that this man that was so on fire to persecute and pull down anyone who was following the way had to be led into a city by his hands because when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. The Bible says for three days he was blind and did not eat or drink. Now, I know you know, a lot of us would think, if I had that kind of, that thing happen to me, like, I think I would be instantly converted and it would just be awesome. <laughs> like, you couldn't tell me anything. I would be like, no, God, I'm following you right now. But the Bible didn't say that that's what happened. You know, I think a lot of times we want something like that to happen. Like, we want the clouds to part. We want the, <laughs> the light of God to shine down and say, do this right now this way. God doesn't work like that. The light, the sound, the clear instructions loudly heard so far that so much that even the people that were with him heard the instructions we want that because it'd be easy to follow that's not what God does <clears throat> and you know I really as I thought about this and I thought about you know we we've heard the Damascus Road experience and we've heard about how Saul became Paul and what he went through but today I thought I'd focus on something we don't think about as much which was what happened to Paul when he was three days in darkness. I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but 
When do you think his conversion really happened? Did it happen the supernatural moment that the light shone and he was knocked to the ground? Did it happen in that rented room in Damascus? Did it happen the minute he heard Jesus' voice? Did it happen when he was sitting there for three days and he couldn't see a thing? Was it something that was just personal between him and God in those three days? Or did it happen when Ananias came to see him and restored his sight by the grace of Jesus? Did it happen when he lost his sight? Did it happen when he got his sight back? I don't know the answer. In, in, in all honesty, I would think all of those are good answers. If I was taking a test, I'd pick any one of them. Indeed. <laughs> we don't know what went on in his head when the lights went out. All we know, all that Luke told us, is that he was blind for three days. And he didn't eat and he didn't drink. I don't know if he was fasting on purpose. I don't know if he decided, I'm, I don't have my sight now, I'm going to fast and I'm going to pray. I, I don't know what he was doing. The Bible doesn't tell us what he was doing. But I can imagine in his mind, he was thinking, I'm in hot water here. I can't see. I can't get around. What happened if, if one of the followers of the way hears that I'm not blinded? What if they come hunting me now? What if someone sneaks into this room? Like, it's not like I would be able to defend myself. There's no one here with me. My, how the mighty had fallen. Darkness. You know, by definition, we tend to want to run from those things that seem to be the hardest. We like to run from those things that try us, that make us uncomfortable those dark places in our lives, those dark things that we know we have to walk through. We don't want to. I mean, if you've ever been in a dark place, you know what it's like to get that phone call in the middle of the night. Instant darkness. You know what it's like when the doctor comes back and sits before you and says, the results aren't good. Instant darkness. You know what it's like when your boss tells you, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to let you go. And you don't know how you're going to make ends meet. Instant darkness. We all know what it feels like to be in those dark moments. We feel small. We feel alone. It feels like no prayer can escape the darkness. It feels like no helping hand can reach into the darkness. It feels like we are literally surrounded and all alone. You now someone here might be sitting in that very spot where you feel like no one can reach me in my darkness. When you're in darkness, when you can't see, you're scared to make a move because you don't know if you're going to stumble, fall in a hole, run into a wall. You're scared to move. You feel like the best thing you could do is stay in your bed with your covers pulled up over your head because that way you can't get any lower. That way it can't hurt anymore. Your darkness. Everything stops. The darkness becomes all consuming. But you know what? If you're in darkness long enough, some other things begin to happen. You know, they say when you go blind that your other senses heighten. Well, I believe when you become spiritually blind and God has you in a moment or a place of darkness, one thing begins to happen is that your hearing begins to improve. Sounds that you didn't notice before, you begin to notice. Those things that God has been whispering to you so long, you begin to hear. Do you get quiet enough? Do you get still enough in your darkness? You begin to hear the whispers of the Holy Spirit. You begin to hear Him. You begin to hear exactly what He's been trying to tell you. Be still, my child. 
Hold on, my child. Know that I am God. I have never left you, nor will I forsake you. Oh, in our darkest time, when we feel like there is no one there, that is when God is at his best. Because that is when he will wrap his arms around you and let you know, oh, I've been here the entire time. I saw the road you were traveling before you even got to this point in your life. I've been here. I've just been waiting on you to listen to me. Another thing that happens in darkness is that we begin to pray. But darkness can even change the way we pray. The moment you run into darkness, the first thing we want to do is we want to bargain. And I can imagine Paul was there saying, God, if you give me my sight back, I will. <laughs> mm, how many times we've said, God, if you just move this from me, I will. If you just make it so that I don't have to go through this pain, I will. But we can't bargain. We can't bargain because bi the Bible says that it's almost like a refining fire, that he is making us perfect. He's making us perfect. The dark times are there so that he can work out those impurities in us so that we can trust him more, so that we can lean on him more, so that we can depend on him more. After we bargain, seems like God isn't listening. Then we get mad. How could you? How dare you? Why did you? I've gotten mad at God a couple times. <laughs> Oh, and that fear bubbles up because it seems like we'll never get out. Anger begins to flow with it because it's how dare you. I have served you for how long and you allowed this to happen to me. Oh, I remember when my, my grandmother was diagnosed with breast cancer. Mm. My grandmother, I literally grew up with her for the most part and there were days we didn't have a car, but Grandma would wake us up at 7 o'clock in the morning, tell us to get dressed, we're going to church. Grandma, church doesn't start till 9.45, but we have to walk. And there were miles, and we'd be like, well, why don't we just not go? <laughs> like, come on, come on, we ain't got a car, we got to work the church. We're talking about a lady who was faithful to have her grandchildren in church four days a week. Because she knew if I just teach them the right way, they, they won't stray. Even if they leave for a while, they'll come back. So when my grandmother was diagnosed, oh, I was upset. And I, 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 I literally, my pastor called me out the pulpit and he said, you're going to pray for your grandmother. And I said, no, not going to do it. Not going to do it. I, I, I couldn't see myself crying out to God at that moment because I blamed God for what my grandmother was going through. God, how could you? She served you faithfully, even though her family won't, even though her family has turned their backs on you. She has still cried out to you. She has still prayed to you. She has still believed that you will save her family. Yet you do this to her? I was upset. My grandmother knew it. My grandmother came to me and she said, baby, it's okay. You're going to pray for grandma. No, no, I can't. No, no, I can't. She's like, baby, you can't. I know what you're thinking. But God knows. She grabbed my hand. She pulled me close. She said, pray for grandma. I couldn't deny my grandma. <laughs> I couldn't deny my grandpa in that moment. But how many of you know that even as I got dear God out, even as I begin to say, God, please, that's as far as I could go because the next thing that happens is that there is a well that breaks inside of you that no longer words will come out, but there is a groaning that begins to happen where you can't even pray words anymore. The Bible says that it is just groanings of the spirit where I had nothing but tears left and groanings. And those are in the moments when you're praying your best prayers. When you're, when you're no longer talking out of your head. 
But literally the spirit takes over and begins to intercede on your behalf. The groanings. And if you stay in the darkness long enough, you get to that point of groaning. I know many of you have been at that point of groaning where all you could do was cry and groan to God because there was nothing else that could come out of your mouth because what you were going through, the darkness that you were in was too overwhelming that all you had left was groanings. I imagine Saul was groaning at that moment. Groaning. Another thing that happens in the dark is that you, be, you begin to see things you couldn't see. Some people believe they see things that aren't really there, like ladders full of angels coming down huh. from the heavens. Most of the time, we like to just say, oh, you were dreaming. It was just a dream. Do you know in Bible times, when God couldn't get through with people by, by whispering or talking to them, he got into their dreams. In, his, in their dreams, he showed them things that would strengthen their faith, things that would even save their lives. But you know, dreams require darkness. Sleep. If you're deeply into lights, late night television, dead of night Facebook stalking, <laughs> then chances are your dream life is going to be a little cramped. I mean, you shouldn't be surprised is that if your dreams come out looking more like a page on your Facebook news feeds <laughs> than a message from God. Because what we feed in is what comes out. You know, there's a, there's a, a, a great thing with fitness that says garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> so what you feed, not only your body, but your spirit, has got to be that of God. You know, Saul didn't have a smartphone with him in Damascus. When his lights went out, he didn't have anything to distract him from the darkness. You know, he might not have chosen to enter the darkness, but once he got into the darkness, I believe that he embraced it. He didn't call for people to come around him. He did not ask, let me, just let me go outside. Let me smell the fresh air, even if I can't see the sun. Let me just go and feel it on my skin. No, no, no. The Bible says that he sat there for three days and three nights, seeing nothing, going nowhere, doing nothing. We don't like those dark moments. No one would willingly elect to say, I, I, I'm ready for my dark moment. Let me have it, God. We don't do that. Someone wants those dark moments. Even Jesus, before his darkest hour, prayed, God, if it be your will, take this cup from me. And Jesus didn't want the dark hour that he knew was coming. Because the Bible says that because he took the world's sin upon himself, that even God himself had to turn his back on him because he was, he was just filled and covered with our sins. Even God himself couldn't look upon him. We've never had to experience God turning his face from us. But Jesus did. And Jesus, before it happened, said, God, please, please, you could take this cup from me. He didn't want the darkness. But you know the thing about darkness? That you can't, you can't appreciate the amazing light until you walk through some darkness. You see, Without darkness, we can't experience, we can't appreciate how good and how gracious God's light and goodness is. Now, we know the rest of Saul's story. It said that a man named Ananias came into Paul's darkness. And he said, Saul, brother Saul, the God, Jesus himself has sent me to you today to pray for you. And the Bible says that he laid hands upon him and he prayed for him and something like scales fell from Saul's eyes. Then Saul became Paul. He went from persecuting the church to being the biggest champion of Jesus Christ. Amen. Saul became Paul. And if he was religious, religiously zealous, 
for persecuting, he became even the more religiously zealous for, for praising, for preaching the name of Jesus. Paul wrote more of the New Testament than any others. He preached longer than any of the others. <clears throat> we don't like the dark moments. We don't want to go through the dark moments. But I am here to tell you today, when you get in your dark moments, and I say this, and I know it's hard, but trust God. I know it's hard. Rely on God. Because when you come through those dark moments, those dark moments are here so that God can accomplish the perfect work in you. <clears throat> because each and every one of us here today has a purpose and a plan for our lives. And in order for us to walk in those purpose and walk in those plans, we first have to be made into the person that God needs us to be. And in order for us to do that, God has to work out some things in us that aren't exactly where they need to be. And in order to do that, he has to put us in that fire. He has to put us in that darkness. We have to go through those trials. We have to go through those persecutions. But God, when we come out on the other side. Amen. That's right. You know, I cannot tell you the Holy Ghost dance that we did when the results came back after my grandmother had her surgery and it was a clean bill of health. I can't tell you the shout that happened when they said, and it was like, we've got it all. Don't even worry about chemo. You're good to go. That's been over 10 years. Hadn't come back yet. That's been over 10 years. And my grandmother is 78 now. And she's still walking around and taking care of kids and not sitting still like she was when she was 50. Dark times come to make us strong. See, the enemy thinks he's pulling us down. The enemy thinks, oh, I got you in darkness. I got you now. But see, he doesn't, he doesn't understand that, yeah, 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 you might have me in darkness, but for a moment. Mm -hmm. But when I get out, the light that I'm going to shine on your head, oh, it's going to be for an eternity. Mm -hmm. I'm going to beat you down. Mm -hmm. I'm running after you. See, you can come at me for a little bit. But when I come up out of this... And yes, I'm coming back to the country. When I come up out of this, <laughs> oh, you better be ready for me because I'm stronger than when I went in. You better be ready for me because when I come up out of this, I'm coming for you. I'm going to pray harder when I come up out of this. I'm going to trust more when I come up out of this. I'm going to be stronger. Face your dark moments and see the amazing light that God was shining through you, from you, and over you. Amen. Amen. Amen.